Hello everyone, today we talk about arms and equipment of the 30 years war, the latter's topic being particularly appreciated by the audience. I must say it never made much about uh, the 30 years war, but it's one of my favorite topics personally. So I promise that, you know, going on, we will enter in the depths of this uh, tragedy, as a matter of fact, uh, talking more about the single battles, but also giving a bit this introductory uh, insights, which I think are necessary for the channel to grow. And I don't know, maybe at some point artificial intelligence will, will take everything over. Nobody will watch this. But um, until that time, I think that um, it, it's been extremely useful, just even methodologically, to... First of all, for me, I mean, as I often say in the video updates, but also for, for the audience to say, okay, again, let's, let's look at this thing from an overall perspective, right? And there is this tendency on YouTube, I see, uh, ah, this, let's, let's look at this war from the perspective of this um, state. As if, and, and in that sense, somehow killing, um, at least by, by definition, the, the laws of reciprocity, because if you um, explain the war from the perspective of one guy or the other, let's say you can, of course, uh, highlight what were their objectives, etc. But if you're telling, um, and so their background as well, but if you're telling how the war was actually fought, then you have to be about the, the single um, uh, you know, clash and how it was fought at the same time by both, because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. Uh, so this is just a theoretical note, but when I think of something more, something, say, more useful, definitely the, the broader picture often helps to just give, an, give a dimension to, to everything, because it, it seems to me that the way hi history is made now is this sort of ever more categoristic, um, almost customization of preferences of what you, sh you should know, right? I want to focus just on this state and this country and this, and not knowing er anything about anything else, or just listening to, thing to the things I, uh, I think I'm more familiar with. Um, and if you invest, say, if, say, creators, as YouTube calls us, invest just um, in this, I think that they just keep on fueling actually a mental weakness. Right, a mental deterioration of, of someone that loses basically the, uh, the capacity of orienting himself in front of these topics. Um, today's video is definitely something a bit more complex because it, it, it's a more distant from from this because it talks at, about technology to some degree. You know, I'm not a technologist for the simple reason that I'm a Clausewitzian, uh, and of course, technology has only a marginal. Uh, importance in, in war, which taken in absolute terms doesn't mean that it's not important, but that is, if anything, instrumental to the strategic and uh, even before that political objectives. Um, and it doesn't just depend on what happens uh, say, the, as far as engineering, say, just mere forces without a, in fact, a doctrine of application. Uh, is concerned. So uh, I just talked the other day about war games and, and what I think in general, but about what I think it, this is the com most, most common attitude towards them. Um, just I was quoting artificial intelligence for that matter uh, as well. Uh, note that I made uh, already some videos about the Dutch and Swedish military reforms at this time during the 80, uh, the 30 years wars. Um, that are very famous, also thanks to Protestant propaganda, because they, they, of course, put this emphasis on the scientific achievement, on the sense of theoretical, but also technological application, the sense that this warfare was a sort of mathematical problem to be resolved, in, in a way that Yomini would have somehow, you know, in embryo. Um, resembled theoretically um, because also of course at the time not just there were great technological in, uh, innovations uh, together with the inventions but also a first um, in fact into, uh, probably the, the, the start of a theory that could find some field of application in real war 
and that often has been read as what was actually happening on the battlefield, which for anyone who studies this topic is perfectly, is perfectly uh, known to not to be the case, and it should be explained as well. Today we'll not that we'll not do that um, specifically, but it's a bit of light motive in some of my videos, especially about military engineering or the one about Montecuccoli, von Balausen, Manius, De La Noue, Machiavelli, etc. We will talk uh, again about these topics because they are very interesting on their own. They're a bit of, of a prelude to what also our Clausewitzian theory as the work of the Prussian was um, is, is concerned. Today we talk about the mere, say, material issues, but with some insight um, about the, of course, tactics, about the general background of the Thirty Years' War. That, that must be understood within the context of civilization, so what Europe was at the time, what was being discovered, what was being experimented, um, etc. But as we've just said, uh, technology is paradoxically the least uh, important, or one of the very least important um, aspects in all of this, when you understand the properly tactical, uh, say, strategical, organizational, logistical issues that these armies had, primarily from a political point of view, right? We have seen it in the video about manpower. <laughs> the problem is that they didn't have the money and the will often to put together such a large force and to organize and to drill it, to train it. But warfare naturally was uh, just of, of, of the nature, it always has in its brutality and the political contingencies that brought to, to this disaster, especially for Germany, uh, wiping out one third of the population for forcing, of course, uh, an, a further acceleration during the 17th century as a well, not just because of the Thirty Years' War, but definitely a lot, um, also probably in culture, in mindset regarding the nature of Europe, uh, confessional rights, um, international conventions, etc. Um, and in this sense, a, sp a specific sense of the need of regulation, right, and of uniformation in the profession of arms, right? The, vi the wide variety of weapons in every class which had been available uh, in the previous century, for example, had been reduced already and systematized by various reformers that sometimes are not uh, even actual people, right? Most of what has been attributed, again, to uh, Maurice of Nassau, Gustavus Adolphus, is something that didn't kick in, in into the Dutch or Swedish armies even, you know, generations after the death of these figures. It's a bit like, I don't know, the Marian reform, all the great reforms that we attribute to one guy actually have practically nothing to do with him, right? Um, the armies just develop on their own, and we are uh, grossly underdocumented uh, about these aspects, right? It's not a treaty, it's not a note, whatever, that actually tells you what these armies were on the field, right? We're much closer to level of medieval documentation than the ones we're habituated for somehow later times, uh, especially in areas like Central Europe, that were already still, I mean, substantially different from even just the, the, the westernmost neighbors, and that yet had met with the same problems along the way, um, the ones of providing the degree of order and rationalization. That's mostly what modernists, especially the um, infamous, um, say, uh, fireworks specialists of the so-called uh, um, military revolution that of course never existed just in case you, you missed that point um, have um, attributed to generally in a correct way at least to the compaction of the state of say, political concentration the capacity to properly supplying this system the armies always cost a dramatic much. I mean, the, the the largest expenses of the state had always been the military ones. These systems worked through that. The surplus of these world was still ridiculous compared to ours. Um, as a consequence, if you wanted to fix some issues, right, invading, like gambling, right, and saying, you know, in the short run we risk this, but maybe we also win something. So, and very often you didn't have even the choice 
about that because everybody was competing in 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 the meanwhile right that's that's a dramatic aspect of civilization right that the fact figure properly about the arm race uh, in in general and the nuclear race uh, and more well that's all something that can't quite be stopped because if you even if you wanted to stop that well at this point they were far from seeing weapons as as the problem and though were their you know certain romantic views had definitely been uh, you know, being somehow disappointed by the introduction of firearms, especially the rise of infantry over cavalry from a more kind of knightly um, perspective, it was still, however, very much alive, even as dismounted knights very often on foot, even within uh, on foot, even um, within the same the same pikemen um, were um, are a matter of continuous update of continuous trouble right even we've seen it yesterday in the video about the second northern war i mean even an overall unsuccessful uh campaign of conquest of invasion etc can push the banner unless of course it becomes too costly because that can happen too and a lot of countries get destroyed in the process um can help still creating a, a sounder basis that you will use to um, in fact levy uh, much greater forces concentrating them uh, with the work at the top and trying to be ever more punching and this is what all the uh, say the, the protagonists of the 30 years war and basically anybody in the world was was doing uh, we have also discussed Pike and Shot in some dedicated videos, uh, made one specifically about the second half of the 16th century, for example, um, but we will look at these various generations all in, in sequence, uh, the more videos I make in general, and we know pretty pretty well, just by the name, what Pike and Shot fundamentally is, right? The infantry arms um, were essentially uh, the pike, the pole axe, speaking of weapons specifically, the musket, the arquebus, that's it, right? Um, so all of them acted uh, together through units, so not as weapons individually meant, because that's in fact how subordinate technology really is, right? Uh, ta uh, uh, technology is subordinated to tactics, not the other way around. Right, technology helps changing tactics, but still tactics are dictated by much bigger things than technology. So they they actually are the ones who mold technology in order to fit uh, them more than the way more uh, than the other way around, as any historian of economics or technology will tell. So the pike was essentially. Uh, by definition, a long spear. There is no other way to, to categorize it. That's literally what it is. Usually something between 4.8, 5.3 meters, right? So actually not even much longer than it had always been in, in other times in history, right? It's the use, right? The type of units uh, in which you know, tactics and doctrine that were fit that made the thing. But, but there was a limit, right, uh, to... To the length that very at some point was also increased or you know the 30 years war is generally speaking a moment in which the pike start say drops in importance but it's not surpassed yet different nationalities had different um, lengths right on on paper at least uh, as far as the, as the pikes um, size were, were, were concerned but they all got down essentially to the, the same type of warfare. Naturally, the longer the pike, the more collective training it requires. Actually, pike fencing, you know, from an individual perspective, is extremely um, rough. It, there is no sophistication at all. You're, you're just into the, the, the pike square. Uh, if you're in the front line, you're, you're basically just hitting like crazy as fast as you can. You don't even look at what you're actually targeting. The important is that you are drilled to perform the maneuvers um, orderly and, um, f say, speedily enough. Of course, there is a compromise between the two factors, um, so that you can deliver all that brutal force 
uh, and channeling it, uh, ch channeling it as, as a column into uh, a section of the enemy line. Uh, and naturally, we will describe how the Pike Square evolved, um, how you know the, the various experiments that were actually carried out also through that, say, as we can reconstruct to those treatises, that very often are ideal. These things were going on from the late Middle Ages, made a video about, for example, some uh, plans for the ordinance of Charles the Bold and at the time of the Swiss Wars, um, and the uh, the we, what we know from from the actual battles that were fought and that those sketch, preliminary sketches for you know the battle plan were were drawn for is that these were not even the battle plans technically were just some sort of the some some virtuism saying now we have to try to stack and it was not even enacted because um, especially on a bigger basis the, the the various battle lines right there is not much you can technically do and uh, the 30 years war and still great part of the later 17th century are a um, moment in which actually things seem to to be bogged down uh, artillery uh, for example like siege warfare shows this sort of statisticization armies get bigger but in this sense also clumsier you know that Basically, this process of hyperinflation of the states finally, from the time of the Sun King, managing to put on the battlefield literally hundreds of thousands of people, at some point cannot handle this. So that after the war of Spanish succession and beginning of the 18th century, they, they decide altogether to drastically reduce the size of arms uh, of the armies because they were unmanageable on the battlefield. We just had this massive bloodbath, but with no much of a tactical or operational uh, inside and so it was just a big uh, mess. We will talk more about 18th century um, warfare as well. So actually, what happened even as far as the pikes that were the the punch, right? They they were of course con conceived most historically like to mostly defend from cavalry because that's um, but the pike is one of the most ancient uh, weapons used in every time in history everywhere, aside from the prevalent uh, equipment. Um, the great, the big change that had occurred in the, uh, of course, in, the, in in those times in history, like during, for example, Hellenistic warfare, the Macedonian pikemen, for example, but later on with the Swiss from the mid um, 15th century to be just emulated by all the rest of Europe was not uh, equipping it was also equipping larger amount of people with a pike but the, the pike men were there since ever like throughout the entire middle ages the first ranks were made of pike men um there was no alternative to face cavalry literally that's the only weapon that stops cavalry not missile not that they, they tried right very lots of people still believe in the sense that cavalry is extremely weak it gets bogged down but i don't know arrows bs right uh, the, the only way to stop cavalry was the pike at best the rest was of course using combined arms tactics but it the the, the size of element was heavy infantry not the light one just like not like cavalry by definition what had happened now is that uh, while during most of the Middle Ages, infantries had just defended and could advance, but when attacked by the enemy, they would just be stopped and be in defense uh, or fall on their flanks. So with a maneuver that just per se was not how those enemies were meant to engage the enemy because they had lost their wings um, that were very often symmetric in, in that game. Uh, now they did advance speedily, and so they brought this large masses of uh, trusting guys um, to um, to of course the, uh, the 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 point of the enemy that had to be attacked, which is not necessarily the strongest or the weakest, but that just for a very simple logic of again taking them from the flank or from the rear, or more of more frequently frontally because warfare, it, especially the the most important one, the bigger battles are symmetrical de facto, even though warfare is always asymmetric, like the, this thing, the, the bigger the engagement, the more it tends to symmetry. Um, they had to punch, to smash, and you understand that uh, essentially by the mid-16th century, cavalry had lost great part of, of its uh, importance on the battlefield, 
compared to the previous centuries because it was actually still very important and it kept doing essentially the same thing, just not in that central decisive way. It had lost its decisiveness. Um, and therefore, pikemen mostly had to crush against one another. It was like in all battle, somebody would attack and somebody would defense. Yes, there are chances that somebody is attacking at the same time. Uh, and that's paradoxically one of the least bloody outcomes. Like the bloodiest outcome in, in warfare, both strategically and tactically, is when one is defending and one is, is attacking. Um, and exactly in this sense, the point was essentially shooting at the pikemen with your shot and or support from, from both sides. Um, and basically what happens until the end of the 17th century is that the pike... Um, is always capable of being enough, right, um, to arrive to the enemy lines without uh, in, in 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 the capability of, of of engaging in melee without being worn out by the shot in the process, right? It was actually a pretty bloody affair, right, and uh, not just for the for 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 the shots, of course, but for what eventually a, a, a clash between pikemen really looked like. Um, but that's essentially how this warfare had happened. So it was actually pretty low, slow, gradual. Uh, these pike squares do not run, right? They 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 are trained exactly to maintain as much cohesion as possible because that's how you you make it to punch into the enemy, um, orderly and delivering all the force. And so that requires to to be slow. Right, and so the shot does is, is as we'll see now is not adequate. It's not uh, strong enough, also technologically speaking, to to be more than the pike uh, on the field. Right, eventually heavy infantry will become shot, but we are in the 18th century. The function on the battlefield is the same, just it relies on a different weapon. Right, um, so. Pole axes were still there. Again, uh, from the end of the Middle Ages, uh, the, the bike square had been conceived mostly made of at least a majority of bikemen because they had to perform that uh, anti cavalry role. Pole axes are not an anti cavalry weapon, uh, at, at least in, in the measure in which it, it can hal- allow. To stop a cavalry charge, the pole axe is a pole axe is just a, a, a brutal axe, right? At the end of a longish pole, right? And the best use you can make of it is essentially against armor at close range, uh, which is definitely something you cannot during do during a charge. But when a cavalry charge is is over, or you're just engaging another infantryman, this thing works literally as a can opener. Right. It the, the idea is that if cavalry penetrates the the pike ranks and you know the, the, there has to be somebody behind who is going to smash against this heavily armored and armed cavalry, um, and so very often down their horses because the the most uh, dangerous moment for cavalry is definitely the one just after a charge because it literally cannot do anything but not retreating right in the sense that. Uh, if you manage to break the enemy better, you can still fight against somebody on the ground. This voice on the ground has, at that point, a greater advantage because cavalry, by definition, cannot defend unless it dismounts. And as we will see, we'll think about the dragoons that are similar things, but in that sense, there were also lighter troops. So it was a compromise also in the term of the heaviness of the, of the, uh, of the arms. And in fact, they became somehow more fashionable later on, mostly in 18th century warfare and or even in the previous centuries in the, on those battlefields that so a, a, a smaller amount of heavy troops, both on foot and on cavalry. We're talking mostly about Eastern Europe. Right? That's where these guys they conceptually come from, the Balkans, etc. Um, I made a video about the stuff, about the, the Dragoons, the, the Ulands, the, and, and all this sort of um, you know, exotic kind of ethnic cavalries that, however, became later some probably types of na- sort of national cavalries later on, like as, as cavalry types, tactical types, different, essentially, heaviness of cavalry with different uh, tactical employments. Um, 
So Paul Axis, as you know, would remain in use throughout the world period of the Thirty Years War. They did have, at some point, also a, a sort of symbolic importance, especially towards the end of the eighteenth uh, of the seventeenth century. You still find it as a sort of special for the NCOs, etc. So guys that had, at some point, just to to look that kind of more aggressive, ready to engage into hand-to-hand fighting, as it had always been the case, but that were becoming you know, individually fighting sense, naturally just more like a symbol, right? Obsolete, because most of of, of the fight was about the order of the ranks and this combined armed tactics, um, maintaining the line, the order of pikemen and the steady firepower, uh, etc. These guys were still crucially important, and you do find, of course, in close quarter combat, lots of pole axes throughout uh, the Third Year's War, uh, habitually used, because they were just part of the complement of the army together with, with pikemen, just in much lesser number. Uh, muskets and harkbuses were collectively called the shot, and th- th- as we'll see, th- there is, of course, a technical difference, but when you read, say, late 16th, early 17th century sources, and they say musket, harkbuse, or other names, um, they don't actually mean much, right, unless you become extremely sensitive, you read like a, a ton of sources about the topic and you start understanding the type of source, what kind of, you know, thing they do mean. There were, there were some muskets were actually hark abuses and some hark abuses were actually muskets, just the way they were called. And technically, they didn't necessarily differ because all these weapons, as we'll see now, also were artillery were historically not standardized. They came out in different fashions, kinds that were also called in very prelinean ways, that is, before our encyclopedistic fixation for definitions and categories kicked in in scientific language, very often was in fact much more, much richer and um, poignant semantically. Um, just an example of this, also in size, muskets were born as a mobile artillery, right? And eventually they, you know, the design was good for how they were conceived and started becoming um, ha- uh, hand arms, right? Um, hand guns. Um, but, um, say, the variety, again, so compared even to artillery, this is true for even during the Middle Ages, where's, where's the difference between a crossbow in a ballista, let's say, to, to some point, right, in size. Uh, you understand that we're just different varieties, and normally there were just the bigger pieces that were less, and the smaller ones that were more. The important was to use them all in concert with one another. So also, the process through which, let's say, the archibus is substituted by the mask, it is very long, and we, it, we are not told precisely uh, what, what it was like uh, on the battlefield by some some degree, right? Both were shoulder firearms, but at this point, um, the musket was heavier, right? More accurate and more reliable than the arquebus, except it costs more, <laughs> exactly for this. So for a long time, just the arquebus was more preferable, and it was abandoned just over time when the musket was refined, uh, say, just through metallurgy, through but various, um, let's say, gunpowder uh, technological changes. There weren't that many, right? Between, like, the, like in this couple of hundred years in the 16th and the 17th century, the, the, the big deal of inventions were first the granulation of power that was mastered by the Ottomans, was essentially like just igniting um, the, the powder to, to make it explode all together just to not to disperse um, energy so that the bullet could receive more of it uh, given time and the bayonet which is not even technically a gunpowder technology um, uh, but just something added to it because of essentially that they were just when the pike disappeared that they kept um, still the, the cold steel as and I made multiple videos about this also about the uh, the army of Frederick the Great during, yes, of course, the, the 18th century, the full 18th century, but um, it's still somehow connected. We'll keep talking about these things, hopefully, soon. Um, whichever was used between the, the musket and the arquebuse, uh, it usually had a bore of around uh, one inch, which is something like two centimeters and a half, and fired uh, a bone-crushing lead bolt 
of between an ounce, an ounce and a half, we're talking about 30, 40 grams, right? And this stuff, like, it didn't have um, essentially uh, any accuracy beyond 100 meters, but within that, of course, there was a lot going on tactically between the various formations. And it was like, you know, a weird time, like still Napoleonic times, you know, that beyond a certain distance, just even a few hundred meters, bullets just bounced uh, on you. Uh, so there's still a lot of armor on the battlefield. In spite of all, there is this, again, attritional process. So just imagine what it meant just as a, as a, as a front rank pikeman just to advance under enemy uh, firepower, just have all these um, various hits, uh, not with dramatic penetration, but very often, uh, considering that before rifle barrels, sometimes uh, wounds were, say, more, even, I mean, stupider wounds were more difficult to operate because uh, projectiles had very uh, astray trajectories, so when they enter your body, they, they, they made a mess inside, as opposed to just, you know, with a rifle barrel, like, going in and out. Um, in any case, again, this stuff really shattered bones, uh, was really, and just from a psychological point of view, under, being under that fire is, is something pretty stressful, to say the least. And at close range, it's, it does start to, to cause uh, horrendous, horrendous wounds. Uh, uh, and uh, again, th th there was a creativity uh, that I documented in, in the video about the Dutch Army of the Eighty Years' War in making infantry and uh, pike and shot interacting. Uh, because the shot, uh, of course, needed some clear path in front of it, but um, it was also more exposed to cavalry. And so they invented literally strange thing, like they applied some s civilian, literal folklore dances. This is typical of the Dutch that they 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 made some sort of pirouettes behind the gaps, like uh, of of the um, of of the pike squares, like passing one sh shot after the other to just keep up with fire. Now, there were, of course, different philosophies about this. So we'll look at them when we're talking about tactics proper. Uh, in any case, the shot was increasing in importance for many reasons that also didn't have much to do with the actual battlefield, open field engagement, meaning that uh, pikes, for example, were very difficult to to carry on campaign. They were very long. Uh, some soldiers uh, essentially shortened them. This was against regulation because there was a doctrine they had to follow. But there were so many engagements also aside from the bigger ones that would have all the pikemen arrayed tightly and orderly as as, as you could. Uh, for this, um, for the pike to be uh, at some point to become useless, right? More of an hindrance at least um, most uh, most contexts. Uh, this was the case during the 40s, for example, during the English Civil War, where the, you know, in the English countryside you have lots of hedges, things like that. Very often you can't even properly deploy uh, effectively a, uh, a pike when there are lots of play, uh, say a, a pike square, there are lots of, um, uh, say, mm, uh, positions from which the shot can fire insidiously, etc. Uh, the Thirty Years' War was also made of lots of raids, skirmishes, etc. So in all this context, it was not even about the ineffectiveness of, of um, heavy infantry. Again, they had pole axes, they had swords, uh, etc. And they could make, as we'll see now, they had pistols, uh, etc. Uh, all useful at close range, but um, uh, you have an effective pike square only if you have lots of people, like thousands, hundreds of them, depending on the size of the of the unit. That also did pose some problems because these units were always under strength, so they had to invent other units organically to make, you know, a functional pike square uh, work. And again, you don't do anything with with a pike if all you have is, you know, a few tens of of soldiers, right? You can hold the line a little bit in some circumstances, it's better than nothing, right? Pikes would keep being used, even in 19th century warfare, emergentially for by militias or something like that. But that's not like the, the full, um, what the doctrine says still at this point, where objectively 
pike squares are important and they're still uh, necessary at least in the major engagements but the practice the sheer practice of war this continues back and forth across germany um you know siege warfare a lot of attrition again ambushes stuff like that it, it starts becoming really something for which guns are much better suited right and these things were still technologically very heavy encumbering that you had to fix them uh, on the ground in order to shoot uh, at least up to a certain point uh, in time um, and they worked in very uh, archaic ways, right? Uh, they both muskets and, and arquebus had initially the same mechanism, the, the matchlock, right? So they, you had basically to to just fire by uh, applying uh, uh, directly a burning match to the pan, um, which you understand is somehow you know bizarre to us for how quickly we are used to think. Uh, of, our, of our contemporary firearms, but to them it was, you know, cutting-edge technology. Um, except it was very, very, very unsafe, very dangerous uh, in many ways because you were holding in the chaos of a battle with people's guts sprayed on you, very loud noises like adrenaline, blood pumping like crazy you're freaking out your senses are all you know your your mind is 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 very difficultly maintaining control in all of this and you have a burning match or two in once in your hand and a dozen or so paper wrapped cartridges dangling from your vest right and this meant that if you accidentally lit them you, you would literally explode Right, and this was the reason why um, the uh, the initial uh, order of the shot was very very large. It was an open order because at least if one guy exploded through setting himself on fire, um, the, with this bandolier, he the, this this the if if the if another shot was was close enough, he could. Just it could be a domino effect of various people on the line exploding one after the other, um, and this thing did happen at some point. It, there was, were some times in which you couldn't really avoid that happening, depending on you may not have um, that uh, type of uh, gr ground surface to do so effectively, etc. Still, right? Uh, Gunpowder technology uh, perfection itself, and it be all this became much safer more orderly, tighter, and it was evenly understood given the, the potential of firepower. Just look at the jowls compared to other weapons such as the bows, etc. at the, the beginning of the modern age. You realize that this was, of course, the future. Interestingly enough, regarding the the latter, like bows, mostly on the fringes of Europe, there was they, they were still used at this point. Right? It would have not been strange on a 30 years war battlefield to see still a, some guy using a crossbow uh, or a bow, right? And con all considered, right, this, the, the, they were still pretty good weapons, right? Uh, they were mostly being abandoned now. Uh, they were obsolete overall, right? And especially the, the wall they use as in a, in a collective fashion was naturally, um, you know, not competing at all with... with Firepower, but um, in, in general, like they were still deadly weapons uh, that were used for hunting, etc. But let's say in a, as we were saying before, in an east in an eastern context, right? Somebody was used to fight a lot with the Ottomans. They still had lots of archers, etc. Again, it's a matter of volume of fire, and if you don't have guns because they cost too much, in some I don't know Transylvanian castle, you have to stay awake for some, you know. Tartar raider passing by you, you may still use a crossbow, right? Together with guns, because they were used. It's like like even think about the bird dishes or other weapons. You, there was an incredible interaction, customization of the stuff, and Central Eastern Europe, where the Balkans, etc., were sometimes still displaying such uh, old-fashioned weapons. The same was true for Britain, that was a bit isolated up to this point from the Renaissance, uh, not really very much updated to continental 
uh, standards uh, of warfare, where at the beginning of Civil War you still had guys that were praising the longbow, right? That um, it had actually been abandoned officially back in 1596 for the army, but looking at the train bands, um, especially, it was, again, the, the longbow was a symbol of the English gentry with some degree, right? And it was a political, it had a political meaning, right? Some guys that can have their own weapon at home, right? Um, even though they distrust the the, the actual military of, of, of the state, right? It was a bit that kind of of um, undertone there. Um, and of course, during the English Civil War, there wasn't much of uh, longbows actually used, and even less with success, I think, even though probably more than, than what we would be prone to think, uh, especially from an individual point of view. Um, but th there was some intrinsic reason why this would just decay. I mean, first of all, it took years to train a proper bowman, while the use of this vile gunpowder was criticized, as we were saying before, also by chivalric epos, etc. could be acquired in weeks, right? And it wasn't even, again, like the pike bed. It was not, like, there were lots of passages. Again, you had to learn to reload the stuff. It was uh, all extremely complex, uh, the, but uh, once learned mechanically, if that, that wasn't the challenge. The challenge was to do so under enemy fire. We've seen how, even during the 18th century, where we say, well, musketry fire is now prevalent. We, um, we can appreciate these lines that go all orderly and fire one after the other. We've seen, even from the army of Frederick uh, the Great, where the Prussians had some of the, the, the actually the highest discipline achievable there, that after the first volleys, these guys literally didn't have the palest idea what the hell was going on, right? They were just trained to shoot, in fact, like crazy, just loosely aiming at something in, in the smoke that still, after the first volleys, wouldn't make you see anything. It's not before our chemical... Uh, achievements at the end of the 19th century began to shoot what with a much less smoke um, coming out of the barrel. Um, but they would. the important thing is for them is just to remain there and still being somehow dangerous for who was in, the, in front of that, but with an accuracy that was ridiculous, to say the least. Um, and that mostly had to do with who would be able to still stand um, uh, their post. Like, during this attrition because somebody was hit anyway at some point uh, and doing it so again in an or in the most orderly and constant way you could into that total mess right that was the actual thing that actually mattered way before any technology right how good you were of course they would uh, as we were saying before they tried to balance the odds uh, and so you would also have the best technology available compared to to the cost right of uh of of it of of the other options uh but again it's it, it, it counted just for a from a small fraction of the whole outcome even just at a i don't know at a company level right so speaking of artillery which was increasing importance of course um at, at this time say that out of the plethora of types in use during the 17th century due to, again, the, the fact that we are emerging from a medieval reality, right? Because all, every commune produces its own stuff. They, they don't have standardized places. All these nationalities that are fighting together, they do not even have the same units of measurement. Everything is very, um, very weird and put together and somehow made work. Um, and this is the reason why kings and generals had manage to uh, establish basically at least a handful of useful and standard types through their reforms. Again, this mostly would occur through sheer practice, right? They they often didn't have even so many pieces, so at least uh, aside from largest engagements, there were ways, and again, constant warfare at the time to, to practice uh, with these weapons uh, in different ways to say, well, okay, look at this gun, whether better to reload to the you know how it's built the, the technicalities what kind of target is best suited like all the various ballistic measurements lots of things going on again in all branch of sciences at this point uh etc understand better understanding of gravity etc 
to, to be more precise, mathematically precise about the, the art of fortifications, etc. Because artillery is mostly a siege weapon. Right at this time, uh, of course, it is used uh, in in open field. We'll see how, but um, to a mm, to a small degree, again, artillery would keep uh, until the uh, very late in time to to make a, a very small amount of losses. Right, but psychologically speaking, it was important to still harass the enemy to especially disrupt, uh, even not just physically, but because of fear, the, the first ranks that were the ones that the guy in the file behind was was to follow, to to follow, right? The first guy in the line, so the most re reliable. That's where Ricochet was at some point preferred because it was not even about hitting the guys, but making them move and disordering the line, not to have their legs uh, chopped off by this bolt passing, bouncing. Uh, in the grass, um, the Dutch standard that was um, one of the earliest right, to, to be um, affirmed by Prince Maurice of Orange Nassau, Captain General of uh, about three quarters of the United Netherlands, ran to five basic types. Now, the guy really knew about this because I don't know how many sieges he successfully um, concluded, right? So it was just the, the sheer hammering rhythm of practice, of experience, right? They, they would understand it on just in a mere... It's about coup d'oeil. It's not even a, a technical calculation. Just having an idea that a certain caliber has that advantage over another. So we're looking at, uh, from the heaviest, uh, the 48 and 24 pounders. Uh, a pound is, is something like 37 millimeters. And as I understand, as bigger guns were used uh, mostly in sieges and prepared positions. They also were dramatic to, to move. I made a bit about at least Renaissance artillery and all the logistical implications of it because it was nightmarish. Of course, to to move the the stuff, um, and uh, you know, but still, again, th this thing opened the, 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 its path uh, because of the sheer destructive force that was needed, especially to to batter the enemy fortifications. Then you had D twelve and six pounders, which, generally speaking, comprised the so-called field artillery, um, and to support infantry. Uh, there were also the four pounders at closer range, right? So, most other armies here, aside from the Dutch, had similar standard calibers, right? So, more or less, let's say the, the tactical needs were this it was not a, a dramatically complex or, or um, let's say, different, right? A varied type of warfare, right? The, the essentials were, were these ones. Everything, again, was very complicated, actually. In, in terms of when we got to the actual quantities, this rain, the, the moral forces involved, so how you could use better all this stuff. They, everybody changed uh, to, to a degree. The, the doctrine, again, experimenting, etc. Guns were used, uh, the lighter ones. Uh, also, much uh, like in the front line, right, uh, of battle uh, to, to cause that disruption, trying something more... Uh, surgical in in that kind of uh, front line disruption uh, etc in any case most of, most battle forces were not about artillery per se right um, when uh, we look at other for example Sweden had all this type of calibers except the 48 pounders, right? And most artillery pieces were also relatively mobile at this point, right? They were at least, they were mostly fixed like, uh, before battle and they had to, to support the army as a role and they were mostly left there if, if uh, there was not much way to uh, to recover them in case of um, of defeat. 
the most famous pieces of the Thirty Years' War were probably Gustavus Adolphus' little four-pounder leather cannon, which um, is, again, it's within the legions of, of the Swedish uh, reforms, etc., but it has actually been found archaeologically. It was perhaps invented by the boy genius artillerist Lennart Torstenson, right? Uh, and people at some point, given the name, believed that these cannons were actually made of some sort of leather. But obviously when we found uh, one of these exemplars in a bog in Germany, dating from the time, and we x-rayed them, uh, this, by the way, this is the only surviving example, uh, we observed that under the, the actual leather wrapping there were a series of light iron tubes, and so that, of course, this were some sort of... It tells you how still uh, innovative, that say, how experimental uh, these technologies were by some degree. But the Swedes, as you know, had... Um, and again, I talk about the Swedish army uh, already, and we'll come back on it more in depth, had this very aggressive combined arms, um, you know, high collective training trained forces um, that required, in a sense, uh, uh, even smaller guns, but it could be brought uh, more closely to the enemy, uh, being lighter, like in this case, and uh, exploiting that asymmetry again, that such speedier uh, force, more qualitative, lighter one, could inflict to, say, bulkier troops that if you know, moving frontally may have even smashed them, but that um, exactly couldn't because of that, uh, of their structure, right? And so the the Swedes really achieved a lot through this. Again, it's not technology, but it's technology that adapts to the tactics that they they were experimenting with, with a much greater employment of of, uh, of cavalry as they. Um, tested, uh, say, a sort of coming back of this arm compared to per previous times by finding against that anachronism of success that the Polish hussars were during the Swedish-Polish wars. The Swedish leather cannon was light enough to be drawn by one horse or two men. Right, so, and it might almost be termed as the first infantry heavy weapon of some sort, because again, the idea was a, a, a support weapon that could be deployed faster than the others and I remind you because we talk about this in for 18th century warfare that the most successful uh, tactical employment of various arms of course was all combined at the same time right in the 18th century the, the, of course it's very difficult you, you must have in fact ever more trained forces all the uh, material equipment, the, the armament that allows you to perform the stuff on the field. Generally speaking, when you combine the power of infantry, artillery, and cavalry, there is not much that um, an opponent without that a parity of numbers can uh, can hope to do. Right then, eventually, this thing can be altered by so many other. Um, factors, but generally speaking, the best armies were exactly the ones that were that performing, and it's no uh, strange thing here to see this Swedish letter cannon, because it was not just an accident, it was designed as such for that tactics. Again, it's not about technology, every single people here could build a letter cannon, but they wouldn't know what to do with it, because they didn't, they, they didn't have very often the type of army that could be that aggressive, that drilled, that uh, synergic in in the var among vari various arms to enact effectively those tactics to require the slider equipment to to have it redeployed so quickly for the occasion, right? Um, speaking of cavalry, which doesn't get enough appreciation, I think, in early modern warfare, because naturally it was, as we've seen, uh, brought down by pike and shot warfare, which is a definitely uh, deadly combination of 
uh, infantry uh, weapons against cavalry um, did profoundly influenced um, the the battle tactics at this time as well right and there had been ups and downs mostly the, the moment of greater contraction of cavalry had been the, the mid 16th century uh, as a uh, as a consequence this this had brought to a, a modification of the type of cavalry that had always that uh, being the shock type, right? Cavalry just by itself, even if it's lighter, can't perform that role. Any unit can, right? But you know of the writer, you know of the caracol, uh, of the sense of the this this um, essentially a sort of uh, Cantabrian circle, which not was not a Cantabrian circle, but more like you know various orderly lines of a sort of column that went towards the enemy unloaded their their shot and then they orderly came in the back of the formation and while the others went shot etc but in all this the um the sense was that you would have to soften up the enemy ranks so coming very close to not just to the pikes that you didn't have to um enter in um at least at that point uh but also to the shot itself Right, so it was a matter of bravery. There were some technologies that, for example, the wheel lock pistol. That at some point, just some that was uh, coming from technologically some clock type of uh, accomplishments uh, in countries like um, consider that the greatest powers here, like Spain or, or or France, were not actually the most technologically advanced. Germany, Italy, these were the most uh, advanced countries, were also the weakest, uh, if you look at them, in at least given that, you know, Italy was under the, Sp the Spanish hegemony, and Germany was being ravaged, again, by, by any other at this point, um, but they, uh, they had, the Germans especially, had introduced this wool lock uh, system to, to, to cope with the lack of shock uh, charge opportunities, right? And and what happened, in, interestingly enough, is that still these guys, all armored, like they shot, right, with their pistols at close range against the pike. But at some point they would charge into the pikes because cavalry always charges into the pikes uh, as much as smashing into one another, etc. Contrarily to what you're often told that you know horses don't do this or that there wasn't such a thing like actual crack you know, crashing at 45 kilometers per hour against either a static target or war, something that arrived at the same speed in the opposite direction. They did it, right? Because if they didn't do it, they couldn't break through, right? And the point is that if the bike formation was softened up adequately by this shooting, of course, combined with some shot on foot and the pike, um, the pikeman's clash, etc., et you could smash into this lines, hopefully from the rear or the flank, but still, right, and the, the wheel lock mechanism cost a freaking lot, uh, but on the battlefield you could, you do have instances of these guys literally throwing the damn pistol in the head of, of the pikeman at the end, and then passing to the sword, um, and then a pretty interesting um, uh, follow-up uh, would occur. Um, the the, the brutality of this warfare was, was, of course, unspeakable. Just imagine, just, I don't know, what a cannonball shot in, into the, say, thickly packed pike ranks uh, can, uh, could do, right? You know, people flying off in the air into pieces, etc. Well, this is completely normal, of course, to, uh, to, a, to a modern era battlefield. And it's not even technically the worst that can happen. Um... And so all these arms have to adapt. And cavalry was definitely the most squeezing to this game. It was mostly about by, uh, the, the square pikes, as we've seen. Um, there were different types, again, of cavalry. Uh, for example, one not too different from the actual old feudal knight, armored cap-a-pied. Uh, because... Uh, 
of course, uh, armor technology had kept improving. The point is that now, in order to keep everybody functioning with something like that, to, to actually stop fire, firearms, which was mostly possible, especially the hand ones, um, if you had a thick enough armor, but it would cost so much that it was, of course, better to invest in the shot, right, for the same amount of metal cost in general, material, etc. So, of course, heavy cavalry was needed because of the shock effects of these guys for the, the sake of combined arms still existed and thus so exposed to all this fire. They had to be ultra-heavily armored. Uh, this is what it began as a concept since the time of the Maximilian armor, the, literally the the, the, the homonymous Ro uh, Holy Roman Emperor design, right? This had to be armor so resistant that if you shot him with an arquebus, that would have not pierced it. Um, and in fact, there were certain types now that were ever thicker, and, but also ever less, um, ever more anachronistic, right? Then there were other types of, of armor that instead were worn just, as, of course, as a defense, also against um, the shot, not just during the cavalry melee, but that, of course, were just protecting so much that was acceptable as a risk, right? We're talking about the cuirassiers uh, that would be similar, essentially, to the ones of later ages that we still have in our military. Uh, and, to, and also other, say, uh, even an armor type of, of cavalry, of course, the lighter one, um, the dragoons, the latter uh, uh, especially capable of uh, not even technically dismounting, but literally being conceptually a mounted infantry. Because that's how it began. Dragoons were infantrymen who could also move on the battlefield. Later, the dragoon instead became, say, in the 18th century, actually something else, like something like properly a, a cavalry unit that could dismount. You'd say, what's the difference? Well, it's it's in the frequency, right, and in the doctrinal uh, employment. But there were also different, um, in fact, sources of this type of infantry that were bred in different spaces that were not necessary. Some were the actual step, some were, you know, uh, more mountainous cavalry, more mountainous, uh, say, this, not necessarily, like, against uh, a nomadic, from a nomadic background of some sort. Uh, and, of course, these had always existed also in the very, the most sedentary places in Europe. You needed somebody who carried out the, uh, let's say, the the, the dirtiest jobs you had to forage, you had to loot, you had to pillage. I mean, the Thirty Years' War really um, shows some of the most horrifying phases uh, of, of war, especially against the civilians. Um, all the, the worst kind of, of brutality that you can imagine. Some of these people were, for example, the, the Croats, uh, the uh, other peoples schooled in the most traumatically violent um, frontiers like the ones between the Christians and the Ottomans, but this is not to say that, I don't know, in the more civilized Netherlands, the Dutch or the Spanish were um, somehow more, uh, let's say, kinder with each other. <laughs> um, again, I cannot stress enough the degree of violence um, and gratuitous, uh, again, evil and massacres and just um, the, the, probably the apocalyptic face that, that that these wars uh, had in various facets. Equipment, as you can understand, was almost as varied as the cavalry types, but there were certain trends that we can highlight. Um, so most cavalrymen were armed with one or more pistols. These were quite useful, as you understand. They were up to some 45 centimeters long, firing a fairly heavy bow with, of course, little accuracy because it's a pistol. There were, of course, some muskets too you could use on horseback, but that's also more complicated. At least um, it must happen in a certain way. There were some type of muskets that had actually the rest mounted for the saddle. But since the Middle Ages, like some handguns did work like that. But you understand it's very impractical. 
And pistols were definitely the better option, as we were talking before about the wheel lock uh, mechanism, etc. They had essentially uh, been developed uh, also for that role specifically sometimes. Um, plus, of course, it was called steel, a variety of swords. Uh, Gustavus Adolphus Swedes that had definitely the best cavalry monk. The Westerners preferred a long, straight, heavy chopping weapon, uh, which had stemmed again from the context uh, uh, with the finest cavalry that existed in Europe at the time, was the, the Polish Lithuanian one, that was still, again, a sort of relic of, uh, of, of the Middle Ages, but still mixed with the very specific tactical needs of, of the Poles, facing various types of lighter, heavier cavalry from the Muscovites to, to the Ottomans, etc. So um, that was a real thing, right? The the actual... Um, the Westerners said still at this point, for example, the Ottoman Sipai, and made a video about that too, were individually superior. There is no doubt that a Polish Hussar was also individually superior to a single, say, Swedish um, cavalryman. But, of course, the... Uh, as we were noticing also yesterday at the Battle of Wars of 1656, combined arms uh, are the key. So the Poles had uh, very good cavalry of different types, but they didn't have so much good infantry like the Germans, for example, the Swedes. So um, this uh, they could outclass their cavalry, but not say the decisive weapon it was at the time. Gustavus Adolphus had fought again, again, uh, again against the Poles and had learned this lesson of properly bringing cavalry again to smash. Right, there are some um, uh, because of the the iron arm there in open field with the Poles, because uh, uh, military changes are not just purely rational. Right, cavalry had definitely maintained throughout all this time um, a a great potential. It was actually coming back way before the reforms of Gustavus Adolphus, but still there was a sort of psychological inhibition to it, right? There were great horsemen still, I mean, Central and, again, Eastern European aristocracy were very good at mounted combat, there were still knights, right? But one thing is that, one thing having an army that has the collective training, the resources, the, the leadership, the morale, the historical, say, uh, say metaphysical sort of um, drive that, like, the young, primitive, hungry, uh, and, you know, Protestantly fanatic Sweden had at the time, in order to achieve that, right? So that, that's the reason why these were the thing. Uh, the Croats that had um, been habituated to live now on the frontier between the Ottomans and the Habsburg, and so that ha had a, a big deal of, a, of an ideal in the neighboring Hungary, what steppes warfare and steppes cavalry actually are, may have been, again, individually excellent, but were lighter, they they didn't have that level of coordination or discipline, right? So they were great, again, at plundering, massacring, uh, weaseling out of in uh, the enemy lines, uh, etc. Um, great forages, great scouts, explorers for reconnaissance, intelligence, etc. But they, they are not conceived just to be... Of course, there are the heavier, like, there, there are the Croat noblemen that really have the smashing capacity, but on average, they don't work calibrated with the same proportions of heavy and light cavalry like, say, the, the Swedes do. Um, for this reason, for example, they have a lighter, partially curved piece, which was later evolved into the saber, right? There were lots of different types of curved swords that have just begin from the Hungarian steps into the east forever up to, you know, uh, the the Pacific uh, that um, are um, again that, that, that if you find in enormous varieties in even in some adaptations that there are lots of Venetian types as well for example are influenced at the time from that 
from the fight against the Ottomans, right? And there are also different to categorize. Again, philologically, we read something, but we do not know exactly what archaeologically what is they refer to. There is an enormous opological uh, field, promising field of research into these things because uh, there is a lot of military history going on. Uh, in those places, which is also uh, underappreciated. Um, as we were uh, saying before, the Polish troopers still clung to the Lanx, which was uh, one um, very specifically uh, created by the state, made of ash, right? And it was the only thing that the, the otherwise scarcely centralized Polish government would provide to the to the Polish oligarchs that were at the hand as literal knights uh, of, of mini armies right just like the the royal one because of their private uh, holdings that you know the, that they held as sort of in fact mini kings within the same Poland um, but they had also a lighter sword of course a more utilitarian version than that of feudal times and they were also quite receptive of hand, of guns pistols etc they they had a very high individual training so they were they used maces they used i mean some some terrifying weapons uh war hammers of all sort and again the the bats of blood that these guys uh you know enjoyed uh with their Sarmatic fury, right? It's sort of nobiliar, ethno-racial contempt towards any sort of inferiority, social, whatever, like the peasantry, which really was embodied in, in the uh, in the literal baths of blood that you can admire even at, at the Battle of Vienna later on, etc. That, but in the very many victories of these cavalrymen over, for example, the Ottoman armies, the Tartar hordes, etc., to defend Poland in places like Podoli, etc. There are people whose psychological background you do not want to investigate, also for the sake of your own mental health, um, but they are exceptional, really, exactly for that. Uh, most cavalrymen wore some sort of helmet, of course, um, and this, given, as we've seen, the relatively bad capacity of of firearms the, the smaller pistols required uh somehow famous like the, this cavalryman to arrive almost at like shooting like unloading their pistol at the direct contact with the temple of the enemy right because otherwise they couldn't quite pierce through through the helmet or so easily they had to you know and, and so this had to be done very quickly with great um, also just having the possibility of coming that close to the enemy and having the, the time that the reflexes just being able to blow their brains out um, but they did so right because armor again was that effective still in part towards um, against uh, against firearms just basically the majority of troops could not afford it like for for the rest for the army as a whole even just as a cost didn't make any sense it was better to have other bikes and 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 shots um next to the helmet there were also some back and breast um uh armor for especially the heavier squadrons uh, as we've seen some sort of cuirassier style and more extensive panoply also for very heavy and sometimes obsolete types in the first place. Uh, again, the the nobility of Europe in the Thirty Years' War was still pretty much in the sense of the idea of tournament, the idea of boasting this individual prowess, the sense that there were a chosen race of people that were called to go by God to rule over the world in his name, to crush the enemies of the faith, to prove their um their transfigurational capacity in holy combat, right? That in a way or another, even for a Protestant that denied the value of works was somehow something to achieve that would show, at least would prove that you were the chosen one. And this again was incredibly imbued into that. We don't live in a time where you know, people th thought in the way the average person thinks now. And by average person, I, it really means something in a contemptuous sense, right? It, 
very often average people think that the average people are the poor innocent martyrs of the situation they are so good that it's terrible the terrible elite that it actually we live in a disgusting world in which the elite sucks exactly because uh, the average people decided that uh, that was not the way to to, to go, right? Um, and of course, there are some advantages d depending on the balance, right? But there are also some disadvantages. Well, at the time, um, the the struggle over Europe, the Thirty Years' War, really was was fought by these people through, with a spirit of abnegation and a true. So the, the age of confessional wars is, is is really showing you the fact that this was about religion, right? Doesn't matter how the historiography of especially the late twentieth, the beginning of the twenty first century tried to make you think, oh, but it's not about religion, but it I mean it kind of was, but it was just more like about, you know, practical things. They were both, right? tradition doesn't know this gnostic dementia of thinking that spirit and matter are two separated things right power is power in both ways and the capacity of transfiguring right of being resurrected in the flesh by the, the force of the spirit was common obvious scientific knowledge as the one that it's constantly redemonstrated today except uh, you know most of those who figured that out do not want to tell it because they have been indoctrinated into thinking that it's not the case. Um, these people instead were, of course, crystal and clear about it, aside from you know, some eradical divergence. And, of course, the, the fallen nature of mankind that doesn't make everything perfect. But this was one of the last ages in which we, we still believed in it. I mean, which we still believed in the things that actually matter, right? I, uh, you know, I somehow pick 1648 in the in the good days as the the last viable time for for you know for tradition. There are also other aspects of technological uniformation that are very interesting to look at. For example, cartography, right? The sense that let's say knowing the world where it was and the introduction for example of the telescope during in the military during the 30 years war is, is really something right the first recorded telescope um wa uh, was was the one in in the netherlands in 1608 right uh, on the urging of Maurice of Nassau, the Dutch adopted it and even tried to keep it under wraps as a secret weapon. Do you think you have to spot the enemy uh, scoping the sea, especially? Think about how this changed even the a sense of movement, right? This was no, this technology was no secret. Just as such, it was being developed elsewhere. The Dutch were very advanced in everything uh, uh, technological because naturally they, they were very active and prejudiced, uh, escaping counter-reformistic um, uh, repression, say, scientific ideas of practical empirical knowledge, etc. They were traders, merchants, uh, so they, they, they are definitely one of the first countries, if not the first country, to have this do documented. A year later, we find Galilei in Italy putting the telescope to good use, uh, even there, it's famous that you know that there was this new capacity of observing the arrival of the ships to, to Venice, right across the Adriatic, looking at this telescope at distances that were before thought not to be able. Just just think to to be to be reached like through naked eye, of course, um, and just think again how this influences the the strategic planning, right? The timing, the of of the operations, etc. Um, Italy, of course, was the main recruiting and training ground of the Spanish army, so that the telescope was soon adopted by Spanish officers as well, and therefore spread to other armies. Uh, and Europe at this point was so interconnected, and again, you can't say we invented what first. Um, Kepler, for example, improved uh, uh, dramatically the telescopic technology to, to, to his degree, again, but like one thing the Europeans now had it was just immediately especially in Western Europe spreading that fast right um, and these were all by the way 
say the telescope does not have a, a radically you know beyond imaginable technology it's it's something that is evidently developing as a technology because there are people who are wondering whether through the current the, the optical knowledge that already existed this thing could be improved to in fact even military purpose which is, is somehow even it this is how the 30 years war represents the first extensive use of the telescope for military purposes although we have no more than passing references to it it unquestionably influenced the course of events uh, and again it's just an auxilium right you have this technology that helps things that you have to do however mostly through moral forces and material availability and the incredibly complicated political and strategic and, uh, game that that the war represents um, Another very important aspect that I discussed, especially for the colored regiments video um, of the Swedish army, colored because the regiments were all colored uh, in the same way, was the beginning of standardization of military dress. Right Now, um, I've always made the case that there is nothing really of, of the modern age that had not existed before. In ancient and medieval times, actually, some units were standardized and uniformed, right? Just not the degree that modernists arbitrarily uh, decided to be irrelevant, right? Uh, to ignore the before. I, as you understand, I, you know, I have actually even a good friend who's a modernist, but since he studied mostly, you know, the late Middle Ages, <laughs> it's as if it were a medieval, medievalist, but it had terrible debates with modernists because they literally it, it's as if it, it's it's incredible i mean that they're most at least at those levels and scholars etc intelligent people but they cannot apparently cognitively formulate the concept that the entire myth that that modernity existed right one thing is saying again it's, it's like the military revolution before like the, the example is there's a military revolution. When did it happen? Something between the mid 15th to the mid 17th century. Uh huh. And what and what happened later? Basically, the exponential, unprecedented exponential taking off of anything military under the Sun King, and you exclude that, right? Because you're lazy, you decided not to study up to that point. And and, and literally, what happens later is is. I don't like the term revolution, but definitely what happened before, that is half of a millennium, actually, from the introduction of gunpowder to linear tactics to, to be considered a, a revolution. Uh, what is what the Sun King actually achieved in terms of actual state building and creating an hegemonic army like the French one in Europe? Then then you, you, you wonder why adults are radically underdeveloped people, because if this is the best that scholarship can uh, can do, which potentially is evidently not. It's it's just an incredibly ignorant and despicable way of unthinking. Um, well, these are the results, right? People feel entitled without any kind of awareness about the, even the, the most elementary scholar changes in the history of warfare and pretending to talk about that. This is not. To say, I, I like Parker's works. This is not to say that we don't thank him for what he did, but he could definitely do without that um, that very unhappy definition that every imbecile now that studies the time throws around because they've been told that they have to just keep on quoting it to to make any sense, even though it's it's BS at best. Uh, so. Uh, prior to the 17th century, of course, the 17th century does have uh, some important acceleration in concept of uniformity. And this is true, again, because it already existed, right? So that we can measure fundamentally some units that had, since antiquity, been issued a specific color for the uniforms. That they, sometimes they had literally to dye themselves. We know it about the Romans, we know it about actually much older times. This was true during the Middle Ages. I even made a video about medieval, say, uniform troops, because already they already existed, right? The point here was extending 
this color to at least all the national troops that were being recruited in much larger numbers as opposed to the mercenaries that were however mentioning Gustavus Adolphus colored regiments in fact also to be uh, in fact identifying like that because that was the actual reason why they did so um because there were of course banners etc but the coup de like the this imme- the necessity of immediately recognizing which unit it it is right reflects on the battlefield the need of much greater coordination uh, it reflects just the greater complexity that armies had uh, reached to this point so in these incredibly messy dusty smoky stinky bloody battlefields um that were covered in dust and smoke as soon as the battle began it was quite important just to, to, to be able to identify through even the aforementioned telescope which kind of unit was on the battlefield um that that you needed to send i don't know an order to issue an order to, to just to realize what was going on if you had some reserves and you didn't know what was going on in the field you didn't understand who was who well it could be really a problem um so um this sort of um uh production again it was not much about the fashion of of uh, of of uh, the clothes but the color right up to very late in time the the main issue was was just the color was not the the type especially officers had this very flamboyant type of dresses you know typical of the time they were quite uh, you know exhibitionistic we can say and they uh it it was about their own sense of uniqueness again of aristocracy etc but there was just like the coat of arms and etc the, the sense that there was uh, some inherent quality even to the symbol the, the color that were using um consider also another factor that clothes and dyes cost uh it is true now that europeans have access to much greater colorants from the americas from from asia etc but what is quite practically the case after a couple of months of campaign your clothes do not physically exist anymore as such right they get immediately worn out and you're literally covering yourself with rags right so ideally you want to arrive with this it's also a psychological thing is to say look at these guys they all go colored in the same way and so is this you know even what they're able to think about at home like they they manage to organize themselves to the point that they even care about this stuff it's a way of boasting like a sort of pride and identity and esprit de corps and again sense of value the 30 years war definitely is witnessing the rise of the nation state that somehow prevails distractively on on universalism so that lower force from the, the catonic element of europe is channeled through the smaller powers that are emerging as such that basically start forgetting about the, the catholic in fact uh, what it means also in paganism uh, point which is the entire point of tradition to follow instead their own secular belief which is the nation etc it's essentially a political uh myopic uh, behavior but it, it's still you know what was also the, what what universalism lost to because of course humanity degenerates more or less at the same time the same ways and it's difficult not to be uh carried down brought down by the whirlwind of of sin etc um and the troops themselves um had up to this point again had all different types of uh clothes to some degree in color garment uh the they were often indistinguishable from the civilians if you picked just the the general fashion right during the third year sport you start having something that um also starts differentiating a little bit from the the civilian side of the story you know one of the great legacies of of the war is 
the aforementioned sense that also the senseless slaughter of civilians were at least in Europe to be to be avoided because these countries after all were there to stay so just becoming so angry let's say to having so much hatred against one another would not be productive politically or diplomatically um, um, and European civilization realized that um, so the, the the exact concept that the military was something else from the rest was beginning to emerge. This also existed historically in, in other circumstances, but um, in fact, once of great satellization or great sense of uh, accomplishment through the military uh, at different times, uh, that have to distinguish these men fr from the others. Uh, this is why, as we were saying before, it's not much a matter of dynasts only, at least, uh, and the, the soldiers that they can levy or or buy to serve for them for their honor um, issues, let's say. It, it's also about single peoples, single countries that, that uh, are going to be represented. And, of course, within this army that is distinguished ever more permanent like the first barracks that are, are beginning at least just now to be to be out there also because unprecedented numbers of troops are being uh, levied like the France of Richelieu uh, puts together 100,000 men very clumsily like again it's not before the Sun King that things get fixed in a truly national sense but um, the, uh, the the sense is that you these people are really something else, and they're proud of that. And so, if you boost that too, if you together with all the practical issues of, again of distinguishing one another, etc., given that these forces are becoming somehow permanent, the regiment is taking form um, as a concept that will remain until uh, national armies, practically in a let's say mass armies, contemporary armies, and even remaining part in it you start having the sense that um, this has a uh, an additional value that also again in terms of moral forces it's going to to be better um, so at first the means were very simple it was they didn't even count a uniform but an armband or an over shirt later entire outfits of similar color if not cut were issued to troops and by the end of the war some armies had regular standard cut and colored uniforms for say the the majority of the forces especially again the national ones the most notable being the long surviving english red coats um but they didn't just have that as a color of course um it's something that came in, though, with a higher degree of centralization under Cromwell with the, uh, the new model army, right? So, again, it, it was a step forward, also statally-wise. See, royalist forces were notoriously much more... They, they fought from poorer places, so they had less resources, but in general they were somehow more medieval or in, 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 in mindset. In any case, uh, until then, to distinguish the troops and to enable them to rally when necessary with greater ease, again, the, the use of flags grew as well. I made here and there lots of videos about flags, specifically, that you may think, oh my god, who's going to watch that? Well, somebody's going to watch that. <laughs> that's, that's already something, I would say. Um, but, again, they're fascinating, because even as art, as there's pieces of, uh, again, the original clothes etc they're very fascinating they have all a very punching symbolism politically religiously that were all one traditionally there was all a specific symbolism of very it's very funny if you look at some sound of, of the english civil war especially they are very there are jokes uh, stuff like that are very funny um the french that had the largest army by the end of the war that they um claim credit for introducing some standardized regimental banners which meant practically that there was some sort of basis or criterion in which you you had to draw this this um images um 
their famous white crosses and colored backgrounds, for example, came to be in general use around the Thirty Years' War. And with all these banners waving over the serried ranks, an early 17th century army would have been a brave sight uh, indeed. Uh, this um, is, of course, evident just by most of the pictures you can you can see. It's true that the, the art of the Thirty Years' War is a bit gloomier, darker, and part of this is because, again, it's Central Europe, it's not quite Western Europe fully, um, but whichever more colored, more updated art, um, etc., you you definitely start seeing how colorful everything really was because that that's how warfare had always been by the way it's not that it began now on the contrary uniformity brought together with itself a big deal of um, of fact flattening right of the differences etc remember that there's hardly anything more colorful than a medieval army um, you know, on on the battlefield, right? But um, this is, in fact, much of uh, the the very symbolism that laid within those colors etc. Was, was actually believed. Um, there were lots of oral traditions that we lost, unfortunately, about it as well, etc. But we are really looking at uh, an a, uh, an enormous amount of. Uh, symbolism from past times that are not so so far away and that again belonged a bit to the folklore to the to, to fashion but still with with a meaning in it that should be recovered to fully appreciate this was still believe was still believed as a sort of divine experience like war the battlefield etc was all these colors were meant to to, to, they pointed at the metaphysical concept, and if you look at the confessional symbolism in this military art, uh, etc., you re you realize how transcendental the entire story was seen like differently from our just you know we want to know about technology and and all this material side of the story. It, they actually didn't care. Or if they did, because of course they were passion, they were and military engineers, etc. They they still thought that there were many more important things that today we do not study because we are too, uh, let's say, uh, just they don't really um, know much about it in the first place. All right, we'll keep talking, of course, about the Thirty Years' War. Let's, if I go on, hopefully, um, I for today I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.